SpaceX has successfully caught the Super Heavy using Mechazilla's chopstick arms. So what comes next? Is this the right time for them to catch the Starship as well? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. As we know, SpaceX successfully performed a spectacular catch with Starship during its fifth flight but had to abandon the effort during the sixth Starship launch. While the main reason was an issue with the antenna connection at the top of the tower, this event also highlighted that smoothly catching a rocket using the tower is far from simple and can lead to situations where the company may need to abandon the rocket at any moment. SpaceX seems to be cautious, avoiding rushing beyond what they've already achieved. However, they are steadily progressing toward their ambitious goal, not only catching the Super Heavy booster, but also Starship itself. Recently, a notable detail was observed on Starship 33, a new set of catch fittings. While many expect SpaceX to attempt catching both stages of Starship, this will not happen during Flight 7. In their latest update, SpaceX clarified, on the sides of the vehicle, non-structural versions of ship catch fittings are installed to test the fittings' thermal performance. This means that these test components serve a different purpose compared to the structural versions. Instead of being designed to bear the loads during catching and lifting, they're purely research tools. Their primary role is to gather data on how those companies respond to the extreme temperatures encountered during different phases of flight. Specifically, engineers aim to determine whether these catch fittings can withstand the high temperatures Starship faces during atmospheric reentry. Collecting detailed data on heat distribution, thermal stress, and overall performance allows engineers to refine and adjust the design for future structural versions. This enables Starship and the Catch Tower to work together more reliably in recovering their spacecraft during upcoming launches. Speaking of this, many may recall the direct landing test SpaceX conducted on solid ground with the SN prototypes, raising the question, why not have Starship land on the ground instead of catching it with the Megazella Tower? Does this mean the previous belly flop and landing tests were pointless? There are several key reasons behind this decision. For most missions, a long turnaround time of several days isn't a major issue. However, for specific applications like tanker missions and to a lesser extent Starlink launches, turnaround time becomes critically important. For tankers, managing fuel boil off is a key challenge. The longer the tanker stays on the ground, the more fuel's lost to boil off. Additionally, the time spent in orbit without delivering a payload is parasitic, wasting valuable resources. Faster turnaround times reduce the number of tankers needed, particularly for Moon and Mars missions where rapid consecutive launches are required. While early at Artemis missions may tolerate a six-day turnaround, future missions demand much faster cadences to avoid building an excessively large fleet of tankers. For Starlink missions, while there's no boil-off issue due to the presence of an orbital depot, the sheer number of launches required makes quick turnaround a priority. The ability to quickly reload Starship with satellites is key to efficiently expanding the Starlink constellation. Once maintenance challenges of early Starship prototypes are resolved, turnaround time will primarily depend on several factors. First, the time required for ships to return to port if landing downrange is significant. Second, ground handling procedures like hooking up a crane, transporting the Starship to the pad, disconnecting accessories, and lifting the spacecraft with the Orbital Launch Integration Tower, OLED, also adds considerable time. Other unavoidable steps include stacking Starship back onto the Super Heavy booster, performing inspections, refueling with propellant and cargo, and clearing the airspace for the next launch. Moreover, catching up with a tower can help reduce part of the dry mass for Starship. Removing landing legs substantially reduces Starship's structural mass. Designing legs that can withstand multiple landings without repairs would add unnecessary weight. In contrast, using simple lifting lugs for the catch system simplifies the structure and reduces weight, allowing for increased payload capacity. The impact of mass on the payload is especially critical for Starship. In the upper stage, every kilogram of non-fuel mass directly reduces payload capacity to orbit by one kilogram. This makes reducing Starship's structural weight, such as eliminating landing legs, a major advantage. In the first stage, Super Heavy, the impact of additional mass is less severe, with an increase of 2 kilograms only reducing payload by approximately 1 kilogram. Additionally, landing and reuse logistics are greatly optimized. If Starship lands near the tower, the chopsticks can quickly grab and stack it. However, this landing carries the risk of infrastructure damage from the engine exhaust. Landing further away mitigates this risk, but requires additional time and equipment to transport the ship back to the launch tower, adding complexity to operations. 
As SpaceX ramps up launch cadence, landing and reuse logistics become increasingly complex. A potential future scenario involves super-heavy boosters landing on dedicated pads while starships land on adjacent pads. This setup would enable rapid processing and preparation for the next flight. Elon's mentioned that the Starship fleet will likely outnumber boosters, creating significant challenges in coordinating high-frequency launches. Securing permits and managing airspace closures with regulatory agencies like the FAA could become a bottleneck. So, were the previous landing tests deemed useless? Of course not. Let's not forget the grand ambitions of Starship, landing on the Moon, Mars, and even sustaining a life there. These landing tests paved the way to making such goals more achievable. On the Moon, Mars, or any other celestial body, there's no Mechazilla to catch Starship. While catching Starship with a tower offers many advantages, future variants of Starship will likely feature landing legs and touchdown on solid ground or drone ships. But wait. Do you think catching a rocket mid-air is easy? Even if SpaceX succeeds on the first attempt, it doesn't make the task simple. One of Starship's challenges compared to the predecessors is mass. The dry weight of Starship's 200 tons for the booster and 100 tons for the spacecraft. During landing, the actual mass could be slightly higher due to residual fuel required for deceleration. However, compared to older vehicles like Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, the mass is significantly more. For reference, dry mass of Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy booster ranges 22 to 25 tons, only a quarter of Starship's mass and an eighth of Super Heavy's. This creates quite the challenge for Mechazel's arms to catch or hold such a big object. Another issue is the thrust and the pressure of engines. Each Raptor 2 on Starship generates 2.3 nm thrust, far exceeding 845 kilonewtons produced by the Merlin 1D engines used on Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Even with only a few engines operational during landing, the thrust and pressure could affect the catching process in certain scenarios. The arms themselves are mounted on a structure and not a fixed ground installation like a landing pad. Descent speed is also a factor. A large, heavy object naturally falls faster even when slowed by engine thrust. Within Earth's atmosphere, gravity's influence cannot be underestimated. Consider the worst-case scenario, an engine failure preventing proper deceleration. This would undoubtedly be catastrophic, a massive metal object weighing 100 to 200 tons free-falling out of the sky. Attempting to catch it manually? Impossible. Not only would the Mechazilla arms fail, but no other structure system could handle it. Such a falling mass could crush any structure in its landing zone and ignite its remaining fuel, causing a widespread explosion. Accuracy is another challenge for Mechazilla. When Falcon 9 and Heavy Boosters return to their landing pads, they have relatively ample space, or in the case of drone ships, they just adjust their position to ensure a safe landing. This means those systems are less constrained by spatial limitations. However, Starship requires an extremely precise guidance system as Mechazilla's arms are fixed to the launch tower. The booster spacecraft must maneuver within the arms' operational range. To illustrate the difficulty of this task, Elon once tweeted a video comparing catching a rocket with Megazilla's arms to catching a fly with chopsticks. Yes, a fly with chopsticks. Thank you, Miyagi-san. This level of precision is extraordinary. In the Starship Flight 5 catch video, it's clear that the vehicles and chopsticks work seamlessly and precisely to achieve a successful landing, accuracy measured down to seconds. Despite the risks, this has always been SpaceX's way of working, confronting daunting challenges head-on. Let's hope that with these relentless efforts, SpaceX will first achieve the goal of catching Super Heavy in the upcoming flight, then catching Starship in Flight 8 soon after. Comment Catch Starship to show your support for all the SpaceX engineers. Wrapping up today's episode is yet another effort by SpaceX, this time happening on the West Coast. SpaceX is gearing up for its Falcon 9 launch of the year from the West Coast, which will include the latest batch of Starshield satellites for the National Reconnaissance Office. This marks SpaceX's fourth orbital launch of the year. Falcon 9's first stage booster for the mission, tail number B-1071, in the SpaceX fleet will be launching for the 22nd time. Its previous flights included rideshare missions, 3, Transporter 8, 9, and Bandwagon 2, 4 missions for the NRO 87, 85, and 146, NASA's SWOT spacecraft, and 13 Starlink flights. A little more than 8 minutes after liftoff, B-1071 will be a target landing on the drone ship. Of course, I still love you. If successful, this will be the 116th landing for Of Course I Still Love You and the 394th booster landing to date. The NROL-153 mission is the first launch of the year supporting the NRO's proliferated architecture satellite constellation. It completed six launches using Falcon 9 rockets last year and listed at least five for this year. NRL 153, 57, 192, 48, and 145. 
The National Reconnaissance Office continues to build and fortify the largest government constellation in history, with proliferated launches continuing through 2028, the agency wrote in a presser. Having hundreds of NRO satellites in orbit is invaluable to our nation and partners. They will provide greater revisit rates, increasing coverage, faster delivery of information, and ultimately help us to more quickly deliver what our customers need. The shift to managing hundreds of satellites in low Earth orbit is something that the NRO has described as a top priority in multiple venues. During last month's Space Force conference, T.J. Lincoln, the director of the NRO's mission directorate, said that the NRO is increasingly moving towards automation in order to better manage complex systems. The good thing about automation, at least with the proliferated, is it's being baked in early on. So as the ops lead for the NRO, I'm demanding those things are built to the system because there's no way to operate multiple hundreds of satellites the same way we do today, Lincoln said. The mission management has to happen. The duty cycle tasking has to happen. The retasking has to happen automated with humans on the loop to be able to tweak that to make sure that we're meeting those operational successful needs that we have to. Colonel Eric Zabrinsky, the director of Space Force's Space Launch and fellow panelist alongside Lincoln, added that automation will help expedite the transition of data from intel gathered in orbit down to those who need it most. It's not just about proliferation. It's about how do I get the data out faster? NRO has been typically known for getting data out there in hours, maybe minutes. we got to get to seconds, Zabrinsky said. We've got to get that data in the hands of decision makers and warfighters within seconds, and automation, AI, and machine learning are going to make that happen. This robustly developing constellation is believed to include Starshield satellites, a government version of SpaceX's commercial Starlink satellites developed in collaboration with Northrop Grumman. However, neither company has officially confirmed that these satellites constitute the constellation. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks for being here with us, and we'll see you next time.